Stacy, both times she's in a swimsuit in this movie, wears swimsuit bottoms and a sweater vest. I, I, <laughs> I didn't sweater know. Vest. I thought it was like a terry clothy sweater vest kind of sure dish thing. Hello world, there's a song that we're singing. Come on, get happy. A whole lot of love and it's what we'll be bringing. We'll make you happy. Welcome to the Pop Culture Preservation Society, the podcast for people born in the big wheel generation who grew up in a time in which avocado was just a color. We believe our Gen X childhoods gave us unforgettable songs, stories, characters, and images. And if we don't talk about them, they'll disappear, like Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition. And today, we'll be continuing to save the ultimate early 80s tribute to adolescence by taking you through the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High, song by memorable song. I'm Carolyn. I'm Kristen. And I'm Michelle. And we are your pop culture preservationists. As we stroll along together, holding hands, walking on. So in love, all we do that we don't know what to do. So in love, so in love. Welcome back to part two of our discussion about the classic film that absolutely nailed its depiction of early '80s adolescence, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, written by Cameron Crowe and directed by Amy Heckerling. We talked about it so much last time, and I think it can be summed up very much like this. So film critic Jeremy Smith says, though it freely indulged in the kind of raunchiness its target audience had come to expect from this subgenre, director Amy Heckerling and screenwriter Cameron Crowe generally keep the film grounded in a painfully relatable world of teenage Mm -hmm. angst. And when he writes painfully relatable... Yes. That, to mm-hmm. me, hits the nail mm-hmm. on the head. Even though I'm sure a lot of people listening right now are like, what do you mean painfully? It's a super funny movie. I love it. Watch it now. Exactly. And I, that's <laughs> exactly. exactly what I talk about yeah. in mm-hmm. last week's episode, um, yeah. that melancholy, and that's perfectly summed up here, painfully mm-hmm. relatable. So how did they do that so successfully? Well, for one, both Cameron Crowe and Amy Heckerling were just barely not teenagers. She was just 27, and he was 24 when they started making this movie. That still blows my mind, you guys. I know. We I talked know. about that last week, and we mm-hmm. think of our own kids, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I know. that their age really had to help with the authenticity of this movie. Right. Mm-hmm. But also, this movie is full Capital F-U-L-L. It is full of music. 24 songs, actually, in total. And some of those songs are burned into our brains, inextricably paired with a scene from this movie. And that music helped this movie speak to us in the language that we were speaking at the time. Mm -hmm. There is a masterful blend of 80s new wave and 70s classic rock. And there is no doubt that the soundtrack to Fast Times at Ridgemont High is one of the things that makes this movie a classic. Yeah, indeed. And it's Mm -hmm. interesting that those two people who were so young were working with a lot of people who were not so young. And we will learn as we move on that hmm, that may have presented some problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before they even began filming, in October 1981, Billboard magazine announced that one of the movie's producers, Irving Azoff, Hmm, that could be one of the older people I was referring to, would be (laughs) issuing. What clued you in? His name. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No teenage Irvings in 1982. (laughs) There just weren't. There were no 20-year-old Irvings. Anyway. I'm surprised I didn't have an Uncle Irving. Remember I had 10 I great uncles, <laughs> Fitchu and Marvin, and I'm surprised I didn't have an Uncle no Irving. No Irvings. So they announced that Irving Azoff would be issuing a double album soundtrack to accompany the film, and Azoff bragged that it would be, quote, a superstar collection of entertainers writing all new original material for the soundtrack. The artists who will write and perform original songs for the movie are... Jackson Brown, original members of the Eagles, the Go-Go's, Sammy Hagar, Michael McDonald, Stevie Nicks, Tom Petty, Poco, Quarterflash, Todd Rundgren, Bob Seger, Billy Squire, Ringo Starr, and The Whispers. Some of that came true. Some of it did not. And not coincidentally, 
Irving Azoff was also a record producer with his own recording company, and he saw this movie as a vehicle hmm, for his artists. Yeah. And so, as you might imagine, that didn't sit well with Amy Heckerling, the movie's director, nor with Cameron Crowe, who just happens to be the former Rolling Stone journalist turned screenwriter for Fast Times. If you can imagine, 27 and 24, they each had a very different vision for this movie that did not include artists like the Eagles. (laughs) This was the 80s, and this was a new and exciting time for music. It was changing, music was changing rapidly, and they didn't think their movie about teens in the 80s should sound like radio from the 70s. Good point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, Azoff, though, was looking for his fourth double album hit soundtrack in as many years, which started with the soundtrack for the 1978 movie FM, which peaked at number five and went platinum. And in 1980, so just a couple couple years earlier, he packaged the soundtrack for, wait for it, Urban Cowboy, which went to number three and also went platinum using mostly artists under contract to him. Remember, he has his own recording company. Um, They created so much music for that movie that they released another album called Urban Cowboy 2. (laughs) Brilliant. So (laughs) a year later. Now, sadly, though, Fast Times would not be his fourth hit album. Fast Times' soundtrack peaked only at number 54. That's that's kind of low, especially, yeah. Part of the reason for that might be what some of you already know, that the music you heard in the movie may not have been included on the soundtrack. Some of the most memorable scenes in this movie are cemented in your mind because of a song, Right. Oh, and absolutely. it's very possible that that song that you love, that you associate with that great scene, was not on the record. And I was one of those people that bought that soundtrack and went, huh, uh-huh. <laughs> this is not what I remember at all. And I probably never listened to it again. I didn't give it much thought. I didn't dig into it. There was no internet. So I didn't go Googling right. why is X song not on this album. So why? Why was so much of the memorable music not included on the soundtrack available to us in record stores? Well, like we said above, Irving Azoff's music was not the vision that Amy and Cameron had for the movie. Heckerling has said she hated the music coming from Irving (laughs) Azoff, but she was forced to use it. Ouch. That's even like in the DVD commentary, basically. She's just like out there with it. And one reason that their visions clashed was because Amy and Cameron were in the business of making a movie, not Mm -hmm. a soundtrack. And they pursued music by other artists to complement their scenes instead of just supporting Azoff's clients. This wasn't business for them. It was art. Amy was a punk and new wave fan, and if it were up to her, Fast Times may have sounded a lot more like the John Hughes movies we know from the 80s. Cameron Crowe had relationships from his time at Rolling Stone, and there was no way he wasn't going to tap into that to create the perfect scene. And a lot of those artists who agreed to be in the movie said no thanks when it came to being on the soundtrack, Mm -hmm. possibly because of restrictions by their record label or the chintzy deal possibly offered to them by Irving Azoff. It's getting very sticky. I mean, listen, I'm just, I'm, I'm creating an image now of Irving in my mind. He's got a cigar, by the way. Um, (laughs) He totally does. I can imagine Amy Heckerling at 27 with Cameron. They've, they've hit it off. They have the same vision for this art, but then she has to go into meetings with Irving with the cigar and he's mm-hmm. looking at her like, who are you? This I have She's a little all girl. these hit yeah. album soundtracks yeah. under my belt, and I can mm-hmm. I know how this works. I know how to put together a soundtrack. Yeah. Do you know how That's much how... money I've made in the last 10 years? <laughs> right. and, and he's, and he's so his funny. cigar, and he's like, and then yeah. he's yeah. like, you know, you know, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kid, <laughs> if I were before. you, I would keep my money. Irving Cowboy well, yeah. earned $275 like million. Dollars. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> also, Irving wears suspenders, and he has a big belly, and he wears yeah, so much. Yeah. And he's he sweats. He sweats when <laughs> he talks. Still, you guys, I kind of think that the soundtrack worked, okay? Because mm-hmm. I think that Amy and Cameron maybe were clever enough to go, okay, here's what he's giving us. Let's see how we can make this work. Because I think that the, the mix of the current artists of the day and the seasoned artists worked. 
because it reflected the musical shifts that were happening during the, these times, right? I mean, those it was 80s a time, yeah, yeah the seventies yeah. rockers were trying to figure out what to do in this new. Um, new sound in this new decade. And mm-hmm. so I think that is reflected well in this movie. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, and you just and you just said how you know the whole reason we're here today talking about this is because the music had a role in making us connect with the characters yes. and making us remember this movie for 42 years. And so even though this was not a match made in heaven, clearly it worked for us. <laughs> Forty-two years later, we can still identify that song as having come from Fast Times. And this is just evidence of how much the music used in this movie is one of the reasons we connected with it so hard. And Mm -hmm. I just want to say, again, the benefit of this podcast is getting to go back with my 50-something-year-old eyes and analyzing the scenes. And I was able to, like, pull up the lyrics for some of these songs and put that into the scene. Mm -hmm. And um, wondering also at the time... You know, were were we getting some subliminal messages? Like, I don't know that I could have told you the words to, especially some of those background songs, Mm -hmm. but was part of our brain hearing those anyway? Because it really does tell part of the story that isn't actually verbalized in the scene, but you know what's going on. And this time around watching it, it did help me uh, go a a layer deeper on what was happening in the scene in a way that I wasn't able to perceive when I was 15. Right. Yeah. I think is that's really interesting, this whole subliminal thing. They ended up, you know, planting little Easter eggs. There's a Bruce Springsteen bumper sticker on Brad's yep. car. Watch the scene in Damone's room and notice totally. the posters on his wall. This is where Amy's yeah. and Cameron Crowe are getting in some of their bands. Also, you know, Damone is a ticket scalper, right? So the mm-hmm. kids come up, they want Van Halen tickets. They want Blue, yep. o- Blue Oyster Blue Cult Oyster tickets. Cult. But this is a way that they were able to kind of put these bands and other musicians in strategically to kind of get their way too. Yeah. That was so on purpose, especially now that we know the story. Amy Heckerling was not just trying to um, put her stick in the ground. What is she doing? What is the... Um, Stake stake her... Stake her... No, plant her flag. Um, Stake her flag. Plant her (laughs) flag. Yeah. 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 Okay. I don't know. I think it's plant her flag because it goes back to the moon landing, right? Hold her ground. Hold her ground. ground. Plant her flag. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. But... At the same time as giving a flavor to the movie. And she actually says, with Damone, I was very, very, very specific. That's three varies. Uh, Because yeah. it was Pete Townsend and Buzz Cox and Elvis Costello and people that I love. I loved ska. I loved punk. I loved new wave. So Damone represented all of the things that I was in love with. So she oh, basically yes. just dumped it all on Damone, right? Everything and it worked. was like... Yes, yeah. it totally yes. worked. And remember when he's tell, telling Rat about the five point plan? His arm is around a cutout of Debbie Harry. Of Debbie Harry? <laughs> yes. In the right. mall record store. In the mall. It's and that yes. mall record store is, did you guys notice? No. I, it's I, licorice I, I, pizza. Oh, yes, of course. I wrote that down when I was watching. Yes, it's Licorice Pizza. So why don't we walk through some of these songs and where they appear in the movie? So we'll kind of go chronologically and we'll talk about how some of these captured the story and helped really the narrative progress. The movie opens with We Got the Beat by the Go-Go's. And honestly, you guys, is there a more 1982 song? It's I'll wait. perfect. <laughs> it's, I, it's, yes. it's perfect. perfect. Yes. yes. So we open with this song that had been released just one year earlier on the Go-Go's album, Beauty and the Beat, and was still so hot and so played on radio that when you hear those intro beats, Right as the movie opens and you see the first thing you see is the exterior of a mall, Mm -hmm. you know, well, I know (laughs) this movie is a home run for me, at least the Uh end. Like I could have stopped it right there and been like, I loved that movie. (laughs) (laughs) It had the go-go's and the mall. (laughs) I was was happy. But really, 
literally this song as the backdrop of all the mall things and in all caps, mm-hmm. all the mall things in quick cuts is perfection. I mean, from the quick cuts of the kids outside, one girl is lacing up roller skates outside the mall. Like, she's just going to skate home. Um, We see Hot Dog on a Stick, the mall movie theater. The mall movie theater was central to our malls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And just the whole atmosphere. I saw B. Dalton, and I just about started to cry. B. Dalton's just in the back. I'm like, oh, it's B. Dalton. (laughs) I know. Cameron Crowe says... We had to have We Got the Beat. It was the soul of the beginning of the movie. The whole movie, you can say, is an elixir brought on by We Got the Beat, which I love that because I feel like it's so true. It sets the whole movie up. Yeah. It -hmm. is poppy and peppy and it's great. But tragically, this is one of those songs that is not on the soundtrack, which in my opinion, Mm -hmm. Irving... You it's a huge out, mistake, Irving. Irving. Yeah. yeah. I just think think of how many more albums, soundtracks they would have sold with the inclusion mm-hmm. of just even that one song. Just that one song. I don't remember owning the Fast Times album. And I guarantee you, if We Got the Beat had been on it, I would have bought it even though I already had, <laughs> had it. Yep. Hence that why was it was only was 68, for. number 68. And it goes <sighs> on forever. You guys, it's, they don't just play the intro to We Got the Beat. They play almost the whole song walking us through the mall. And in that moment, they inter- introduce us to every character, every yeah. setting. We get to know exactly where we are and who the people are and what this movie is going to be about. And they were lucky to get this song. Because like you said, it was a huge song. It had gone platinum. It must have cost a lot of money to put it in the movie. And this was a low budget film. It was only four and a half million dollars to make this movie. So I oh, wonder wow. how much of that went to get We Get the Beat. We got the beat. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next up, we're still at the mall. The next few songs are all going to be background music at the mall. And so these are the songs that you may not have even noticed. And the next one is I'll Leave It Up to You by Poco. This is on the soundtrack, and it's our first example of a song that would have driven Amy Heckerling crazy. (laughs) Because Poco is best known for the song Picking Up the Pieces in 1969. Well, there's just a little bit of magic in the country music we're singing. So let's begin. Which is a lifetime away from 1982. Wow. But notably, the band included Timothy B. Schmidt, who was also a member of the Eagles, <laughs> Irving Azoff's <laughs> client. So you know, it, I'm not, we're not even going to play the song because it's, it's not that great of a song, and you don't even hear it in the movie, so who cares? The next song in the, in the mall is Love is the Reason by Graham Nash. This is also on the soundtrack. This is another great example of a song that would have really irritated Amy and Cameron. With no disrespect to Graham Nash, if you are making a movie aimed at teens in the early 80s, Graham Nash, a 40-year-old <laughs> folky from the late 60s, would not be the perfect fit, Right. No disrespect, wonderful music, but for other people, right? Not teenagers Mm -hmm. in the early 80s. I have a theory, though, about the Graham Nash song and some other songs we'll talk about in a little while. Okay. And that is... I when I when that was playing, I knew the voice. Okay, I didn't know the song, but mm-hmm. I recognized yep. Graham Nash's voice, and mm-hmm. it gave me. There was kind of like a comfort and nostalgia, like a I recognized it, and it gave me. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say a funny feeling in my tummy, but ki- kind of that. And I probably remember hearing it when my parents were playing it, or you know, we're talking about that mid early 70s Crosby Stills Nash and um so I some of those songs again to me are strategically in places where I don't even need to hear the words I just got a feeling when I heard these distinctive mm-hmm. recognizable voices it's an interesting because you've pointed out that it did work for us and maybe part of it is because of what you've just said and so you're right they had to figure out how to do it so I think right. that's why some of them are just at the mall so quietly right. that you cannot even hear them yeah, mm-hmm. this, this is true. Yeah, and um, I agree. I uh, Listeners, there's another link we're going to put in um, this week's Weekly Reader and in the show notes uh, from Screen Rant. And it, it's great. It has every song that you hear 
in the movie and what scene it appears in, in order. Mm -hmm. And when those, I'll leave it up to you and love is the reason. When I was watching the movie, I was like, kind of had one eye on my computer. Like, where is that song? Sometimes they're like so low and they might be like 10 seconds. Yes, and that's so it. Quick. Yes, and then yes. it's on. Oh, so and then it's quick. on the soundtrack. Like, yeah, Irving, check. We got you. <laughs> yes. We got you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. I did it, Irving. The next song is one we all love and know, and that is "American Girl" by Tom Petty. Okay, this song sadly uh, uh, was not on the soundtrack album. So not if you bought no. the soundtrack I album know. to hear "We Got the Beat" and "American Girl," you would have been sadly disappointed. This song was originally released in 1976 on Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers' debut album called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, their self-titled album. I did not know that. I know. How about this fact? It was released as a single, and it didn't even chart in the United States in 1976. Okay, here we go. It didn't... Um, even come on the charts for us until 1994 because it was released as the second single on Tom Petty's Greatest Hits album, and it only peaked at number 68. Oh, my crazy, God. Wait right? a minute. I'm shocked know. by this because that that's yes. crazy. But don't you that feel like you've known song. it? For my but whole I life. Yes. Yeah. But, I, but when I realized originally 1976, I thought, well, I don't think I know it from 1976. So I think in my mind, because of the movie – I've known yeah. it my whole life because of the movie, even though yeah. it wasn't released on the soundtrack. So you couldn't have heard it again, really, until wow. 1994. So it was planted in your brain in a, a single instance in the movie right. theater, and you carried it with you until it started being played on the radio again, maybe in 1994? In 1994. Yeah, four. I this know. This is blowing my brain a little bit. It is crazy to think that the song was ranked number one on Billboard's list of Tom Petty's greatest song. So they're saying this is the number one song yeah. that he ever released. And he originally released it in 1976 when no one listened to it. But yet, like you said, we feel like we've known it forever. Perhaps yeah. mm-hmm. because it accompanies what I consider the most, one of the most iconic scenes in this movie. Agreed. Talk about mm-hmm. all the things that you learn in this scene when this song is playing and how it is used so effectively and placed so well. Okay, American Girl plays on that first day of school scene. So we've got the instrumental before any lyrics start. Oh my gosh, you guys. If you just freeze some of those scenes, you're kind of getting this um, pan of the front of the school and everybody ready to, you know, kind of go in and you see different outfits and people are like doing each other's hair. Um, there's a girl that's reading The Pearl. If you, I remember having to read The Pearl. It's a job uh, for... What's The Pearl? Okay. Oh, it's John Steinbeck. It's like a classic... Oh my um, God, yes. That's yes. Right. Book that I'm thinking. Yeah, it's a classic high school book, and I'm thinking it was on her summer reading list, and she didn't read it because it's the first day of school, and she's going and she's carefully trying to go through it really fast. And then when the lyrics start. We're in the building, okay? And right when they say, Well, she's an American girl, I can't sing. But right then, we get Jennifer Jason Lee on the screen, and we know, okay, she's an American girl, and this is going to be – the story is going to revolve around her. They don't have to say that. You just know. And we're all of a sudden in this high school, all-American high school hallway, where all – again, these things that you recognize are happening. One being – one of my favorites is when – Rat is getting a drink from the water fountain, and it sprays all in his face. Oh, my gosh. Do you guys remember when that would happen, when you'd lean over, and someone would have, like, stuck a piece of paper or something in one of the yeah. little spouts, and all of a sudden, you your face and your hair would be drenched. But I want to talk about the clothes in Stacy. And Jennifer Jason Lee is the Stacy character. Yes. So you really kind of get to see what she's wearing, and it is almost a Fair Isle-ish like sweater Mm -hmm. with a button-down Oxford underneath it. I am raising my hand because that could have been my, I mean, it was my uniform, but even if I wasn't going to school, it was what I would wear out to the football game or to um, the movies. So I was probably wearing it while I was watching the movie. I was probably wearing that outfit. For me, the the most iconic part of her outfit is the barrettes she wears in her hair. Totally. Yes. (laughs) Yes. 
They came in all different colors. It looks almost like a plastic oval and has a right. little stick in it. And you go under your hair and then up back and clip it. And she wears those several times in the movie. I want to go back to the song for just a second because while this song <laughs> oh is... Gosh, the, yeah, remember? About. Okay, what is, what is happening during American Girl could be the source of everybody's number one stress dream. And that is Stacy walking around mm-hmm. the high school with her schedule trying to find her classroom. And then sometimes I'll lose my schedule and then I don't know where it is. And then I have to go to the office to get a new one, but I can't find the office. So I'm watching her and I'm like sweating. I'm like, this is where it all comes from. And I'm still (laughs) dreaming about it. Right. It is an all American feeling that so many of us have had that we continue to dream about it. So really in the first two scenes of the movie, Mm -hmm. you are getting the two slices of life of teen life in the 80s. You get a full song of the mall and you get a full song of the first day of school in high school. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the next song we're going to talk about is the song. Carolyn asked earlier, do you have a song that you associate with Fast Times? And for me, This song, since 1982, has always been the Fast Time song. And Mm -hmm. that's Somebody's Baby by Jackson Brown. So to set the scene... Stacy is sneaking out of the house after her mom tells her goodnight. She's fully clothed under her covers. She gets in Ron the Stereo Guy's car. And if you remember, Ron the Stereo Guy is much older and she's told him that she's like 19 or something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. She is actually 14. And they go to this place called The Point, which is really just a baseball dugout. Yeah, the romantic feel of somebody's baby it's almost juxtaposed by Stacy losing her virginity, spoiler alert, on a bench in a dirty yeah. dugout. Yeah. You guys, there's no foreplay of any kind or caring by Ron the Stereo Man, I might add. And as it happens, we see her looking, as, as the sex happens, <laughs> we see her looking up at the graffiti on the ceiling. She's almost disassociating. And it's so heartbreaking and so terrible, yet... I also feel it's a brilliant use of point of view by Amy Hecker Lane mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that scene is making us feel uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm sure was her intention. Somebody's Baby was the only hit from the soundtrack. And they say it was the movie that helped drive the chart success of this song, which I, I get. I think that this is a song Mm -hmm. many people associate. You can see her climbing out the window as it's going. Okay. And that that's so interesting because it is he's here for a lot of reasons because Jackson Brown also is a frequent collaborator with the Eagles. The Eagles. (laughs) Yes. Right. He wrote their biggest hit. I think this song is so brilliantly placed because it's. Like you said, it's a very sweet song, and it's called Somebody's Baby, and it's telling you what the stakes are. All Stacy wants is to be somebody's baby. That's mm-hmm. what she's here for, and that's what we're going to watch her try and get. Unfortunately, what she doesn't know is that she's not going to be Ron the Stereo Guy's baby. And so that's kind of sad. And the way they're setting her up in her room um, and her mom comes in and tucks her in. She's a little girl. She's her mom's baby. She's somebody's baby. And then the mom leaves the room and she sneaks out of the house. She's growing up. And she's trolling around in the middle of the night while, and then Ron, the stereo guy, is going to pick her up. The juxtaposition of that, mommy tucking her in and then going to lose yeah. her virginity Good with a stranger. Good job, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you very much. She's going to be somebody's only light, going to shine tonight. Yeah, she's going to be somebody's baby tonight. Next song we're going to talk about is Raised on the Radio by the Ravens, which is on the soundtrack. The Ravens were a local band based in Baltimore. The scar smoking Irving Azoff, he got a demo that was passed along to him by um, the manager of the cars. Something 
If you remember, the scene is when Brad is washing his car. I want to read you the first stanza, and it says, um, I was raised on the radio, just an all-American boy. I found my favorite toy. And I think, again, like American Girl, here we are seeing Brad do what, to me, a lot of guys were doing. If they had their own car, that was their toy. That was, Mm -hmm. And washing it was like the ultimate. We were a generation that was raised on the radio. The generation now, you know... I mean, they think the radio is Sirius XM and where you get to like right. pick your genre and everything. <laughs> so again, the lyrics really help tell the story and propel it um, forward. And we learn a lot about Brad just in that scene where nobody is talking. This is also the scene while this song is still playing where we learn that Stacy and Brad are brother and sister. And oh, yeah. this is the first time we see that. And I thought that was so cute, too, for that song to be playing because it is like they were raised on the radio. And mm-hmm. you you can tell right away it's established that they have a very sweet relationship. You know, she gets the flowers from Ron, the stereo guy. Yeah, um, I'm assuming. And she's like, oh, my gosh, you have to hide these, please. You know, don't let mom and dad know. And he takes them from her and he's going to help her out. So. I think just the song, it's just a cute, it's just a really cute feel good scene between yeah, those two is. with him <laughs> with his car and then him and Stacy. And, um, the song is perfect. And also, you guys, do you remember how important, like we would buy a, a different radio to put in our car? Like you would go yes. to the audio yes. place and they would install a radio and take out like the one that came You'd with the car, which might have just been, yes, or mm-hmm. a tape deck. Like those were separate items and you could get like I a pioneer. That was like one of the big expensive <laughs> ones. I bet Ron the stereo guy yeah. knows. I, well, I bet yeah. he does. I, I bet, bet he does. does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That the radio yeah, that was, was so a big important. deal. And the woofers oh. and the speakers and the things you yeah. could get like the extra. Subwoofers. Yes, mm-hmm. subwoofers. And the tweeters. <laughs> <laughs> the woofers and the tweeters. Mm-hmm. Raised on the radio. Raised on the The next song that we hear in the movie is called Uptown Boys, and it is on the soundtrack. This, Carolyn, is going to be one of those songs you go, huh, this sounds a little bit familiar. What is going on? So this is when Damone is delivering his five-point plan for picking up women with Rat. He's he Remember, he's the Linda to, um, right. to Rat. He's the one who's sort of teaching Rat how to do these things he's so unfamiliar with. And we're to believe that Damone is really um, suave and deboner, as we used to say. Which he so is it not. Plays very, he is not. I'm yeah. glad you said it, as we used to say, because in my head I was like, do I correct her? Do I correct her? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Suave and deboner. So it plays very quietly underneath. You hardly even notice it. But if you listen very carefully, it sounds just like Carol King. So we're going to make. Carol King? No, it is not. It is not Carol King. It is Louise Goffin, Carol King's daughter. <gasps> no. no. Yes, it is. Yes, <gasps> it is. Louise Goffin is the daughter of Jerry Goffin and Carol King. She was the youngest artist on the soundtrack for Fast Times, and her debut performance was when she was just 17 years old, opening up for Jackson Brown. I said it in last week's episode that it seemed... I don't want to say incestual. What's the word? It's just very, it's yeah. like, oh, that's. It's yeah. like co-mingling. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. 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 There yeah. was totally. a lot of Every, that. So many, so many connections. She right. also sang something else that you guys will know, that a lot of people huh. will know, that people feel very strongly about. She sang the theme song for the Gilmore Girls with her mother. What? I'm a huge Gilmore Girls um, fan. And it's so cute because that they sang that's Carol King song as solo artist, yeah. but that she had her daughter sing with her. And it's a show about, about mother mothers and daughters. And yeah. It's very cute. Where you lead, I will follow anywhere that you tell me to. If you need, you need me to be with you, I will follow. Recently, I was visiting Michelle in Denver. And you guys, I was so impressed how seriously she takes the meals that she makes for her new dog. 
It's true. Yeah. Our pup Frankie is a two-year-old Australian cattle dog, mixed rescue. And since I imagine she probably ate nothing but weeds on the farm she came from, I want to give her the best and tastiest nutrition possible. And that's why I feel so good about giving Frankie Badlands Ranch. Actress Katherine Heigl, she's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation. She says she's seeing more issues with dogs' health than ever before. And after doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to support any dog's health, their food. So she decided to create something she could actually feel good about feeding her dogs, and it's called Superfood Complete. Superfood Complete is made with over 30 of the healthiest ingredients on the planet, including several superfoods vital to your dog's health. And bonus, Badlands Ranch also supports the Jason DeBus Heigl Foundation, which has helped rescue thousands of dogs and place them in loving homes, just like Frankie. And I'm here to tell you, Frankie loves it and gets so excited when she sees me reach for the We have a great offer that we are excited to share with all of our dog parent listeners. Go to BadlandsRanch.com slash PCPS and order right now to get up to 50% off your regular priced order with a 90-day money-back guarantee. If you want your dog to experience all these incredible things, go to BadlandsRanch.com slash PCPS today. Hello, listeners. If you've been listening for the past few months, you know that I've been experimenting with a new clothing rental membership from Armoire. After the pandemic, I fell into the routine of pretty much not getting dressed at all. Ever. I basically had nighttime pajamas and daytime pajamas, and it was a habit that was so hard to break when it was time to start leaving our houses again. Was I comfortable? Yes. But did I look like me? Not really. That's where I thought Armoire might be helpful for me. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. My membership has helped me build a better wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and look a lot more like me than my pajamas did. Is comfort still a priority? 100%. That's one of the things I'm learning as I experiment with new styles. There are clothes out there that feel like pajamas, but I still look like I got dressed in the morning. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then, when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out for more new-to-you styles. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash PCPS. That's armoire.style. A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash P-C-P-S to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try our more today. Hi, everyone. This is Michelle, and I want to talk to you about my post-menopause symptoms. TMI? Not with this audience. Listen, for what seems like 92 years, I've been waking up in the night with a wet pajama top. I know a lot of you know that feeling. I've experienced mood swings, bloating, racing thoughts. Basically, I felt like I'm living in a body that's not mine. But I'm so happy to report that all of that is changing since I started taking Hormone Harmony. I've noticed a huge improvement in all of those things I just listed. And you guys, I've even weaned off the hormone patches I've worn for the past six years. And I'm not the only one who's loving it. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And there are over 17,000 reviews where women mention that Hormone Harmony has helped them feel like themselves again. Hormone Harmony contains science-backed herbal extracts called adaptogens. Now, here's the beauty about adaptogens. They help the body adapt to any stressors, like chaotic hormonal changes that happen naturally throughout a woman's life. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off on your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code PCPS at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use the code PCPS for 15% off today. Don't you want to feel like yourself again? Next is one of the biggest controversies in the entire soundtrack slash not soundtrack. The song is Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. This is the next scene in our movie. It is not on the soundtrack. (laughs) So if you recall, step five of Damone's five-point plan for picking up women is when you get down to make an out, whenever possible, put on side one of Led Zeppelin four. The next scene opens immediately after he says that, and it's Rat and Stacy in Rat's older sister's car, and 
cashmere is blasting on the stereo. This is their first date, and he's trying to implement Damone's advice. But what Led Zeppelin fans around the world will tell you very loudly and annoyingly is that cashmere is not on Led Zeppelin 4. It's on physical graffiti. I never in 10,000 years would have known that. I just would have been like, oh, it's Led Zeppelin. So Led Zeppelin wasn't really down with letting people use their music in the movies. So 24-year-old Cameron Crowe used his Rolling Stone connections to help them agree. Let's massage this agreement. (laughs) But for some reason, they were only able to get cashmere. That's the only thing they could get. So I have to wonder, why didn't he just change the dialogue to say, listen to side one of physical graffiti? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's kind of funny because I think it's kind of, it goes in Rat's character. It absolutely That he does. heard yes. Damone, yes. but he's like either he messed it up, he yes. mixed it up, or he doesn't have that one. So yeah. he just hears Led Zeppelin. Any Led yes. Zeppelin will do. He's so, he's so anxious about this date and he's so... He wants to impress her so badly. And Cameron Crowe agrees. He's like, this is the point, people. Rat is not savvy like Damone. He's like, enough already, people. Quit your bitching. (laughs) Um, Because people are still, to this day, will be like, "Uh, Mr. Crowe, I just wanted to point out an inconsistency in your movie from (laughs) 1982. (laughs) And he's like, shut your face. Um, And he says, yeah, it's a joke, you guys. That is the point. Rat isn't a player. He's going to whiff the details. And I think that's also the time where I'm first getting a clue that Damone doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, you know, we think he is all (laughs) suave, but really, that's the makeout song you're going to choose? Like, have you ever really made out with anyone? I'm thinking you don't really know what you're talking about, (laughs) Damone. The next song that we hear is Love Rules by Don Henley. Yes, it was on the soundtrack and written specifically for the movie. I chose this song to tell you guys about because it was that voice. Love rules. Oh, love rules. And of course, I recognize Don Henley's voice because of the Eagles. So the scene that this is playing in um, is when Stacy takes Mark Rat to her house after their date. They come back to Stacy's house and she brings him into her bedroom. She's going to show her his photo, her photo album. Um, oh, yes. mm-hmm. Meanwhile, she's so put bizarre. on her robe. She's taken off her oh, dress. Yes. On her she, robe. she puts on Who her robe. Who does that? Who well, puts on their butt? Like, come on in. Let me let me put on my bathrobe. But you know what? Right. Maybe it came from Love American style because they were always going to slip into something more comfortable. <laughs> And this so is maybe very that's true. what she thinks she's doing. Yeah, but how, exactly. How would Rat feel when suddenly she comes out in her bathrobe? Well, I think well, we kind of tell. see it He's on terrified. his face. Look yeah. at his face. Exactly. He's terrified. Yeah. He's terrified. And if we remember the um, earlier time where she's with a guy and um, knowing that something is going to happen, it is very like we've said before dirty. We're in that dugout and all that stuff. She's going to make this like Love American style that she sees on TV. This is going to be this romantic Mm -hmm. moment. So notice it's a different song. And again, lyrics. Lyrics matter, people. And here is the first few lines of that song. Every day you pass her in the hall, you just pretend that you don't see her at all. You want to tell her how much you care. You want to call her, but you just don't dare. Love rules. Ooh, oh, that's rat. Love rules. That's totally, that's rat in a nutshell. Exactly. Mm-hmm. He's got exactly. such a crush on her. He does. And as we know, in the scene as it goes on, she's kind of initiating stuff. And it gets to the point where it could go a little farther. And all of a sudden, Rat remembers his sister needs the car back <laughs> by a certain time. And he, you know, gets nervous, which let's face it, that was a lot of guys. Yeah. Most guys probably mm-hmm. who wouldn't want yeah. to admit it in high school in those situations. It's it can be intimidating. And he's just paralyzed. He just gets yes, paralyzed. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. she doesn't know, you know, Stacy again is taking Linda's advice and going about trying to be somebody's baby the way that Linda says she does it with her adult boyfriend, her man boyfriend in Chicago. What she doesn't know is that rat doesn't go at Linda's speed. Well, right. And 
I think subliminally maybe, and I don't know, again, if we heard these consciously, these words, but we get the feeling Mark sees her differently. He doesn't want to just do this act and be done and check that box. Mm -hmm. The rules of love are different than the rules of let's just do it in a dugout kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. That being said, how uncomfortable were you during this scene? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. I was just as uncomfortable at age 55 watching it last week as I was Mm -hmm. when I watched it at age 13. And Mm -hmm. so many things are so weird. Like that's that's when the character of Stacey started turning for me. I talked about this last week. at age 13, 14, when I'm not seeing her as I do now as an adult, I was then sort of seeing her as like, she was putting him in this awful position. Now I yeah. see I see everything she's going through and I see what she was longing for and what she thinks is right because of having talked to Linda. Because of Linda. Like you just mm-hmm. said, Carolyn, you know, rat doesn't move at Linda's speed. Well, we learn throughout this movie that neither does Stacy. Be- right, right. I think we see it in the I, the photo album it part is is kind of, odd, but you also see where they really bonded over like their middle school or elementary school teacher. Like they had this moment of connection. It's really cute. And um, I feel like, oh yeah, that's what they're trying to tell in this uh, scene is that there, there's this connection and it doesn't have to be all about let's go. And that's when she seemed the most natural. And as the viewer, you want it to stay in that place. Like that would have been right. such a successful interaction if they had stayed in that place. But instead, Stacy wants to try and make out with him. And that's where Rat is paralyzed. He's like, oh, I don't right. know what to do. But as an adult now watching it, when she starts to make out with him, I'm like, oh, Stacy, you just ruined it. You had such a beautiful moment with him. And you were going to be somebody's baby if you had stayed mm-hmm. in that moment. But instead, you push the envelope because you think that's how you get to be somebody's baby. This is true. And that's what we thought. That wasn't that far-fetched. I mean, let's... Exactly. That's the message that even if we didn't have Linda's in our lives, I feel like that's the message the media and, you know, the things that we were consuming at the time was yet sending to us. So the next two songs, this is very interesting. There are two eponymous songs in this movie called Fast Times and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And both of them are dumb. Um, The first (laughs) one is... The first one's called Fast Times at Ridgemont High. It's by Sammy Hagar, and it is on the soundtrack. So despite the name Fast Times at Ridgemont High, this doesn't feel the least bit like a theme song at all. It's not anthemic. You can barely hear it. It's weird to have an eponymous song that doesn't even get featured at all. And all I can figure out is that it was intended to be a theme song, but Amy and Cameron hated it and buried it. So the next one... Right, don't you think? They're like, this is Mm -hmm. a dumb song. We're not going to even feature Mm -hmm. it. The next one is called Fast Times. It's by Billy Squire. This one is better as far as eponymous songs go. It's at the big football game. And it gives you a very high school Friday Night Lights feeling. Like, yay, look at us. We're in high school. We're living our best lives. Everyone wants to kill Lincoln. That's the other team. Kill (laughs) Lincoln. Isn't that funny? Did you guys notice that, like, kill Lincoln and then their button said assassinate Lincoln? Get oh, it? no, I didn't know. <laughs> that's hilarious. I thought okay, that was that's so clever. clever. That's clever. Yeah. But it's still kind of weird to put your song in the middle of the movie. At yeah. the point that in a, in a moment that is not important to the plot at all. This football right. game has nothing to do with the plot. So these two kind of lamish songs make me wonder what happened to the other eponymous song called Fast Times that was written and recorded for the movie that didn't – not only did it not get on the soundtrack – It didn't even get in the movie at all. It was written by Nancy Wilson and performed by Hart. Nancy Wilson, who would go on to be Cameron Crowe's wife, didn't get in the movie or the soundtrack, but she eventually did put it on one of Hart's albums in 1982 called Private Audition. The next song is included on the soundtrack. It's called Never Surrender, and it's by Don Felder. And probably the reason it's included on the soundtrack (laughs) is because Don Felder played the mandolin for who? (laughs) The The Eagles. Eagles. (laughs) (laughs) One of two mandolin players, I might add. Because you got to have two. Um, Yeah. So Never Surrender is the song that's playing when Rat and Damone stop by Stacy's without invitation, I might add. 
uh, to hang out with her and Linda by the pool. And Stacy lets them in, but Linda is uh, just from immediately not having it. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. they're so immature. What yeah. is happening? Um, and it, the song, Never Surrender, it's making a funny nod to the fact that Rat is trying <laughs> to get another shot with Stacy um, after what we just heard. He had to leave very quickly, make up a lie, and hightail it out of her bedroom when she made a move on him. Uh, I will say this scene bothered me at at age 13, Mm -hmm. 14, and it still does now. And it's because... (laughs) The guys are so juvenile and amateur. (laughs) Their version of flirting is to cannonball in and splash the girls Mm -hmm. and, you know, all that stuff. And Linda is just like rolling her eyes all the way back. Oh, Linda's just like up on her elbows. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, now this song is played, it's very quick, but Mm -hmm. that's a scene that I always remember. So I wanted to talk about it. And I also would like us to talk about Stacey's swimsuit, if we could. Yes, thank you. Let's do that. Um, Let's do that. Ladies Mm -hmm. and listeners. um, (laughs) You know, we can all picture Linda's swimsuit, and Kristen's going to talk about that in a minute, so I'm not going to go there. But Stacy, both times she's in a swimsuit in this movie, wears swimsuit bottoms and a sweater vest. I I thought it was like a teary, clothy sweater vest. Kind of sure dish thing. This scene comes on, and I say to my husband, I was like, is she wearing a sweater vest? Like, (laughs) what is she wearing? And it's in contrast to Linda's swimsuit, which it's form fitting, and this is not form fitting. Whereas Linda is dialed, Stacy is not dialed. Right. These are moments where we see that she's still maybe kid like. Like maybe she doesn't even yeah. care what she's yeah. wearing. Yeah, I think it was done very intentionally to make sure that Linda stands out. And that's too right ugly honey, to not have. <laughs> The next song we hear in the movie is the most egregious omission on the soundtrack. This does not appear on the soundtrack, and it is to the sadness of everyone who bought this album, <laughs> mostly the boys, I'm guessing. So, um, yeah, we're still at the pool. Hmm, that's your clue. We're at the pool. <laughs> This is it. This is the big moment right here. It is when Phoebe Cates emerges from the pool in a way that is too beautiful to even describe. It defies description. Like it's filmed so beautifully and she's sprinkled with this glistening spray from what? I don't know. Is it a hose? Like where's the, <laughs> where's the spray coming from? It's And the song is atmospheric as fuck. Like, and I, and I can't hear this song without envisioning this scene. It defines the scene. Oh, have I said the name of the, of the song? No, I was just about to say, and what song was that, Kristen? <laughs> this song is Moving in Stereo by the Cars, and it defines the scene. I don't know how to listen to this song without this scene. Is it even a good song without this scene? I don't even know. The song has become synonymous with watching somebody sexy do something sexy. And it's been parodied like crazy. It's been used to indicate sexy time for voyeurs in so many TV shows, including The Family Guy, One Tree Hill, Stranger Things, Parenthood, Scrubs, Alias, The Sopranos, and more. And the song itself was never a single. It's buried on on an album somewhere. And the reason is that it doesn't follow regular song structure. It's really a sonic experiment. And it's exploring... The stereo spectrum of sound going back and forth between the right and left speakers, which is moving in stereo, hence the name of the song. And it's known among audiophiles as being one of the best songs to listen to with headphones because you'll hear the song coming in and out of each of the headphones. Never released as a single, so there's no chart history, but it was popular on rock radio stations. But it is iconic thanks to Phoebe Cates. And Judge Reinhold. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, that, he had a little bit to do with that <laughs> he scene. He had a little yeah. bit to do with it, as we know, um, as we discussed yesterday, last time. Yeah. Yeah. 
I want you to, I did this uh, a couple days ago. I want you to watch that scene. Sorry, listeners. I'm asking you to watch that scene again, <laughs> but um, turn down your volume. It is oh. so different. Oh, So when she gets out of the pool and you just hear that instrumental, that's what I feel like that's, that's just as much what makes that scene yeah. effective Agreed. as is her beautiful body getting out of the, yes. and the way she just like tips her hair back oh. and then just slowly looks over at him. Mm-hmm. Try it with uh, no sound. And it's just sort of like, oh, wow. Wow. Takes so much away from it. Okay, and then the next song we're going to talk about is called The Look in Your Eyes by Gerard McMahon. This song is not on the soundtrack, and it's used so quickly in the movie. This is what's playing behind Stacey and Damone's secret hang, the first part of it when they're sitting at her kitchen table. The lyrics of this song suggest a longing and connection that the two cannot fight. But I really, I never bought it. I always felt like she just wanted to find someone to do it with. Like I never really bought that she liked him. And Damone is clearly uncomfortable being there with her. It's like he's, and you can see at the table, he's already feeling guilty because Rat's his friend. Mm -hmm. But you know, the hormones of a he can't say 16 no. year old boy I start to get cringy in that scene. I get totally cringy and this song actually has a very bittersweet sound to it and I think it's because this is a, a conflicting scene she wants mm-hmm. so badly to be somebody's baby every change baby, you like the wind in my heart I've come to know you so well baby, when I tell I'm sure as I wake up in the- this is how she's going to do it. She's She just went out on a date with Rat. Now she's going to try and have sex with Rat's friend. We're all uncomfortable. Damone is like, ooh, I really want to do this, but he's my friend. I think the bittersweet feeling to that song is because that's part of the growth experience. It's not danger, danger. It's, oh, come on, you guys, I'm sad. <laughs> I'm sad yeah. about it. yeah. And then when they're actually doing it, this is when there's a reprise of Somebody's Baby. She's got to be somebody's baby. She must be somebody's baby. And it's just quickly, and it's quickly because Damone prematurely ejaculates, so it doesn't go very (laughs) far. If you don't if you don't listen for it, you'll actually miss it. But it's important. And again, is this subliminal? Is it re- that's, it's reiterating her wish to be somebody's baby? So in both mm-hmm. sex scenes of the movie, they're playing somebody's baby because she thinks this is how you make that happen. Except it's very clear that that's not going to happen, especially when Damone like, Bleh! and then I suppose I shouldn't really act that out. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That's, we won't do that for that the podcast. Great. That is special Patreon content. Really to is. pay to see that, Kristen. Well, and they make it very... It's very clear That's in the behind movie. a paywall. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Damone. Like he you see his he keeps his socks on. They have a shot of just their feet, you know, like in the in the uh, formation that feet would be when you're having sex. And Damone has his socks on and his feet mm-hmm. just sort of start shaking. Like you're like, oh, no, this isn't going to well, last very long. Interesting <laughs> fact. There was actually a, a nudity, a full nudity scene with him nude and they cut it oh because it wouldn't have got it would have gotten an x rating. X rating. Yeah. But they can but show go the, ahead and show the girls. Yeah. Yeah. It's such females. a naked scene. It's so naked. There's so much Jennifer Jason Lee. It's like full on boob. She's just lying there and it's not comfortable at all. Mm-hmm. And it's it's yeah, why doesn't that get the X rating? Only he would get does. the X rating. You know what it is? It's not she doesn't look nude. She looks exposed. Yes, that's a great totally. way. Mm-hmm. That is a great mm-hmm. way to describe that scene. And I feel exposed watching. I it, feel exposed even now. Yes. Yeah. And I did yeah. then too. Mm-hmm. Totally a different feeling than you feel watching Phoebe Cates. Absolutely. Topless. Yes. That's a good way to put it. That's there's a big difference. Huge difference. Did mm-hmm. you guys get the feeling when um Damone and his socks when he gets up quickly and runs away? Did you have the thought, huh, I think he was a virgin? Oh 
Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. That was, oh, yeah. That was, they don't tell you this in the film, but you're thinking, this is his first time. And here he's getting, giving Rat all of this well, advice. Right. I like, mean, it's the same everything. with Linda. You know, yes. what, mm-hmm. what actually has Linda done mm-hmm. when she's giving all this Do advice? We know. Yep. But these two na- more naive characters are looking to these. Um, other characters for all the information, which is all, all wrong, the and they answers. don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah, they're just making you guys. It how up. much? How much truth is in that, though? Yes. Cameron Crowe, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Writing those two characters because, and he had gone to the high school. We talked about this last week and witnessed this. But I go back now and think about the girls in um, all years of my high school that we looked up to as kind of the ones who were the Lindas, right? Yes. <laughs> how much of their persona and what they were putting out was just all smoke and mirrors. Yeah, how right? much of it yeah. was true and how much of it wasn't. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could go back and tell little Michelle that. I know, right? Right. I don't know that I realized then when I saw it that they were frauds. Like, I wonder if she I don't thought think we I would, either. We yeah, would I pick agree. up on that or not. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. I, But I don't know that I got that in the first watch of it. Right. It might have been later. I, I just loved her. And you still just wanted to be that you cool totally girl. Did. Oh, yeah. Even yes. if you were going to be a liar, yes. you wanted to be her. <laughs> and if you think about it, this is, and I've said this several times in this podcast, this is the business of high school. This is what our job is in high <sighs> school as we become um, sexual beings. And it's no different from having a new job, right? When you have a new job and you don't know how to work the cash register, all you want is to get some experience so you can be at ease with using the cash register and mm-hmm. you're so nervous until you get that experience and so in high school you do look to everybody like they do they are how come they're so they use the cash register so easily and they know how to they know how to give change they know oh, how to yeah. do returns that's such a hilarious oh, metaphor <laughs> they push the buttons with such confidence yes, yes they know and when the drawer buttons. pops out and when the drawer pops out they know just what to do they know how to push yes, it back in they know how to put the, the without drawer getting their fingers it's true it's just it's all about being nervous because you don't know how to do it and you just and you you just wish to be on the other side of that experience so you wouldn't and you think you're the only one that doesn't know how to do it when in reality Mm -hmm. these people obviously don't know how to do it right either listeners i hope you appreciate how (laughs) the three of us once again, can take an episode about the music and the soundtrack of a movie, and we've now turned it into an entire like discussion and dissertation of what being a girl in high school is like. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. boy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's true. Yeah, because the boys, mm-hmm. are they have the same fear, too. They just got to get to the other side. Yeah. Oh, if I could just get to the other side. Everybody has to do Well, you can tell it. Damone is scared out of his skin. Yeah, he's yeah. scared. Oh, my God. Okay, the next scene <laughs> where we have a song is so funny. The song is Waffle Stomp. It is on the soundtrack. It is by Joe Walsh from The Eagles. The Eagles. <laughs> the Eagles. <laughs> He's from The Eagles. The German we bored sit around with nothing to do. They say work is hell. Hell and no disgusting. This song is perfectly placed. It's got kind of this dorky honky tonk bounce to it while Brad is driving along in his pirate hat to deliver some fish sticks to an office. <laughs> and he thinks he's all that when this cute girl in a convertible comes driving up next to him to check him out. And he's like, yeah, you can keep looking. Look at, keep looking. Yeah, he winks but she's at her. Really, yeah, like he winks, but he forgets he's got his big old pirate hat on. And she's sort of like laughing and he thinks she's flirting. She's laughing at his damn pirate hat. So, this is one of the best fun facts of this movie. The girl that's in the car laughing at him during Joe Walsh's Waffle Stomp is Nancy Wilson from Heart, who was Cameron Crowe's girlfriend at the time. How many times have I seen this movie and I never picked that out? She's, Mm -hmm. it's not even fleeting. I'm looking right at her and I never went, hey, that looks a lot like Nancy Wilson. Never. It's very reminiscent to me of the scene in Vacation when Chevy Chase first is flirting with um, Christy 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 Brinkley. Brinkley. It is. It's the same scene. It's the same scene. Yeah. Our next song is Sleeping Angel by Stevie Nicks. 
And yes, we are lucky enough to get this on the soundtrack. It was actually supposed to be on her debut album, which was called Belladonna, that had been released the year before in 1981. But that's a song that had gotten, um, you know, chopped, so to speak. But again, lyrics matter, people. So this song is playing in a scene where Stacy is waiting for Damone to pick her up to take her to the clinic to get an abortion. Because when they were together, that one little moment in time in the pool house, she got pregnant. He reluctantly agreed to help pay, and then he would drive her to the clinic. So this song, Sleeping Angel, is playing while Stacy is waiting outside on the sidewalk for Damone to pick her up and drive her to the clinic. And she's looking up and down the street, and his car isn't coming, and she realizes he's probably not coming. The never hold me down You're asking me to trust you Well, there's little love that around The song is really somber, and so you kind of get the feeling this is like one of the more serious um, scenes in the movie. So she goes inside when he hasn't come to pick her up and calls him at home. And his mother answers the phone and he, she said, oh, hold on. Oh, he can't come to the phone. He's in the garage with his dad. All right. I want us to just take that for a moment and realize this is very kid-like. So she's calling him and he's in the garage with his dad. And right when that is playing, these are the lyrics. Take me sleeping angel. Catch me when you can. Real love affairs are heavy spells for a woman and a man. And right when she is making that call, you hear the line very distinctly, for a woman and a man. And at the same time, you're hearing his mother say, oh, he's in the car, in the garage with his dad. Like, you're realizing oh. these are kids. Like, this yeah. is not yeah. a woman. It's a boy and a girl, not right. a woman and a man. Exactly. Oh. And again, this is another song that I recognize the voice right away. And I would have recognized it Mm -hmm. right away in 1982. And I think, again, I got that feeling in my tummy. All those Stevie Nicks songs kind of give me the same feeling. They're not like the Mm Go-Go's or anything. The feeling that I get when I listen to Stevie Nicks's songs and her voice, immediately, I felt that way in this scene. And it just perfectly Mm -hmm. paired for me. I get the same feeling I get from this song as I do from Landslide. Yes. What is that feeling? I guess we don't have to come up with a word for it's it. A it. It's, it's, it's a melancholy. It's melancholy. That's what it's I, not just yeah. sadness. It's like a bittersweet feeling. Yeah, sometimes. a little yeah. bit bittersweet. You, yeah. And it's, um, there's another important part of this song. Um, prior to him not coming to pick her up, you see Damone on the phone um, calling all of – because he's a scalper That's and he's true. calling all of his clients. And he's shaking people down for money like, you didn't pay me for those Van Halen tickets. I need – okay, I need – because he needs his $75 for his half of the abortion. He is trying to be a grown-up in that moment, and you see him failing because nobody is going to shake, is going to cough up any money. And when he's not able to get it, he just sort of gives in, and and that's when you see, well, he's still just a boy. He can't solve this problem. He tried for a second mm-hmm. to be a grown-up, and it didn't work. So he's just going to go out in the garage yeah. and hang out with his dad. Yeah, that's but sad. come to the rescue, Judge Reinhold. Yes. And everybody probably knows what happens yeah. later on. But yeah, that yeah. that big brother, little sister relationship in this movie. I always wanted a big brother and I always Aww. wanted it to be like that. Like, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. he'd be, you clean the pool, I take out the garbage. But at the same time, he really loved me and would have my back. And, mm-hmm. and think of how serious that is for your for a big brother to come upon his 15-year-old sister and realize that she is going to the abortion clinic. And he's not mad either. He's not no. like, who did this to you? Which right. is kind of what you would assume somebody would do. He's really mm-hmm. more like, let's just take care of her. That's right. Mm-hmm. Way mm-hmm. to go, And judge. then it's over. It's over. Mm-hmm. Our next song is Speeding by the Go-Go's, and it is included on the Fast Time soundtrack and only on that album. This song, I think, is played perfectly. 
when Damone, who now, just to catch everyone up, now Linda has found out that Damone didn't show Mm -hmm. and to take her. So... (laughs) Uh, this is the song. So she writes, um, what does she write on his car? Why am I thinking now? Prick. Yeah. Prick yeah. on his car. Can we all just talk about, Damone drives a gremlin, you guys. I know. A gremlin. I, I know. Gremlins. <laughs> oh my God. We had a gremlin. When he gets to school, he finds out that his locker has been vandalized with graffiti and the words little prick have been sprayed across it by Linda, we can assume. That's right. In retaliation, like I just said, because he ghosted Stacy when she had to have an abortion. And here's a sample of the lyrics. It says, I can't explain the way I feel every time I get behind the wheel. The rush of blood comes as the power surges and my right foot urges the car to push on through the night. So you're getting this great soundtrack for the retaliation of Linda. This is about female rage. And I love knowing those lyrics because you can see that's exactly what I felt about Linda is that she was going to put the the accelerator down and she was going to vandalize his car and she was going to vandalize his locker and she couldn't stop. She's got her foot down. There's no brake. She's not braking. Right. Yeah. She's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. going through all the stop signs because she's so mad at that little prick. to the end of the movie now and we're at the graduation dance where there is a cover band doing mm-hmm. a cover of Life in the Fast Lane by yes. the Eagles. <laughs> but this is this place where we're all going to make up. Everybody is, it's kind of like, um, you know, everything happens at the dance. So now that everybody made up at the graduation dance and everybody's good, everyone's cool, now we're back at work at Perry's Pizza at the mall. This is our coming of age moment. And the song we hear is So Much in Love by Timothy B. Schmidt, of course, from The Eagles. (laughs) The Eagles. This is on the soundtrack. And it is our theme. This is the theme. It's so sweet. Stacy has figured out that she really wants a nice relationship, a nice guy to treat her nicely. And that might be rat. As we stroll along together, holding hands, walking on along. So in love, all we do that we don't know what to do. So in love, so in love, so in love. This song plays as she reestablishes for him at Perry's Pizza in her little uniform, in her little fast food uniform, that she does like him. And they wave to each other from across the food court. It's so high school. a cover of a doo-wop song that was originally released in 1963. It's been covered by tons of people. I didn't know this. As far as I knew, the only time this song was ever performed was in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and I didn't know it was a member of the Eagles that was singing it. Because this also doesn't sound like an Eagles song, so I, I don't even I don't know who Timothy that. B. Schmidt is. Should I know who that is? It doesn't matter. No. <laughs> He's in the Eagles. I think Timothy B. Schmidt went back and forth between a lot of bands like Jackson Brown and the Eagles and Poco. He was in all of those bands and probably managed by Irving Azoff. It's hard to say that name. This song, I can't believe it. This song only went to number 59. In my head, this is a hit, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It went to 59. And Billy Joel has said this tune was the inspiration for his 1984 hit, The Longest Time. Yeah, it's the same. Now the similarities, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Longest time. Yep. So much. And now, after we, after all of our people have come of age, everything has come together. Everybody's apologized to everybody. Even Spicoli has passed Mr. Hand's class after Mr. Hand comes to his house and gives him like a little, like a little one-on-one tutoring. It's all good. Everyone's going to graduate. It's all good. And now it's time to say goodbye to our cast. And Amy Hackerling fought and fought so hard for this last song. 
to ride us out of the movie. And that is Goodbye Goodbye by Oingo Boingo. And it is not on the soundtrack. <laughs> is our goodbye song and it plays on the screen as we get epilogues for all of the characters the whole story is wrapped up all we're doing right now is waiting for the credits and they're going to tell us on the screen what happens to everybody for instance mike damone works at the 7-eleven and is arrested for scalping ozzy osborne tickets linda she now attends college in riverside and she lives with her abnormal psych professor Jeff Spicoli saved Brooke Shields from drowning, and he blows the reward money hiring Van Halen to play his birthday party. And love most it. importantly, Rat and Stacy are having a passionate love affair, but still haven't gone all the way. Right. And, and don't forget my boyfriend. He became the manager of the Mighty Mart. <laughs> the right. Mighty Mart. That's yes. Right. So it seems like... Amy Heckerling fought super hard for this to be the ending of her movie. So she got the opening that she wanted with We Got the Beat, and she got the closing she wanted. And then in between, we get the Eagles. So <laughs> we've gone through <laughs> we've gone through the whole soundtrack. We've gone through the whole movie. And there are truthfully a lot of songs that no one's heard of that we just talked about. But yeah. we've made this argument that the music was so important, and it helped us bond with the movie. So my theory is that the music we remember so hard that really defined this movie was really just three songs. It's Somebody's Baby, it's Moving in Stereo, and the third one. What do you think? I don't so know. So much in love. As we stroll the something together. together. Yeah. And just because there are only three songs to me that I identify as being from Fast Times, uh, that doesn't mean anything in terms of the success of how they use the music in the movie. Because every single song that they used, I loved the way that they used it. And you yes. know what? I'll take those three songs. I ta I'll take them. I love them. That's good enough for me because those three songs did their job. They did their job. And mm -hmm. because we, we can hear them today, 42 years later, we are instantly transported to Ridgemont High. And we remember all of our friends. We remember Brad and Stacy and Linda and Damone and Rat and Spicoli. And we might even feel a little flutter of what it felt like to be young and in love. Thanks so much for listening today. And we will see you next time. Well, today's episode was brought to you by the Eagles, I'm sure. <laughs> and by these fine Patreon members who are next level supporters of our podcast and who we honestly couldn't do any of this without. And today we are saying a special thank you to Barbara, Scylla, Susan, Joanna, Jane, Carolyn. Hey, Carolyn. Is no, that you? it's not me. <laughs> Jen, Cindy, Sharon, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. It's not <laughs> me. for the Kristen. <laughs> but I do support our podcast. And Jill. Thank you guys so, thank so you, much. Everybody. Yeah, In the thanks. meantime, let's raise our glasses for a toast, courtesy of the cast of Three's Company. Two good times. Two happy days to Little House on the Prairie. Cheers. Cheers. The information, opinions, and comments expressed on the Pop Culture Preservation Society podcast belong solely to Carolyn, the Crushologist, and Hello Newman, and are in no way representative of our employers or affiliates. And though we truly believe we are always right, there is always a first time. The PCPS is written, produced, and recorded in Minneapolis, Minnesota, home of the fictional WJM Studios and our beloved Mary Richards. Nanu Nanu, keep on trucking, and may the force be with you. Spread